Holy history, Batman. We're here at Camden Yards, but today we're not talking about baseball. We're actually visiting Jeppy's Entertainment Museum. We're going to talk to Andy Hirschberger about the history of pop culture and comic books. By the hammer of Thor, let's go. All right, could you tell me the history of Jeppy's Entertainment Museum? Well, Jeppy's Entertainment Museum was founded by Steve Jeppy in 2006. It was based on an idea he had been generating in his head since the early 70s. Him and some of his friends used to hang out at his comic book shop, which used to be under a TV store, and they'd talk about what they'd like to do with their material. And Steve and his friends would often say, you know what would be really great for this stuff? A museum. A museum so we could share it, because it's not just us that loves this. Everybody does. And Steve always liked to refer to his uh, comic shop not just as a shop, but as the clubhouse. And so he wanted to make the grandest clubhouse he possibly could for all of his friends and people who love the material to come in and see it in a way that said, we love this material. Let's make it look as elegant as possible and yet still as fun as possible. So he had that in the 70s? That in idea? the 70s. Wow, because that's one of the things with comic books and I, it's one of, in my opinion, if you're a fan of comic books, mm -hmm. you look at it as literature and art. Yes. Um, but people who are not fans of comic books look at it, or at least recently I believe it's getting more, more recognition, but for a no. long time they were just the funny books. Or... It's, it's, a very, uh, it's a very polarizing item, even though there's been tons of studies that show that comics not only encourage literacy, they can also help out with certain, uh, certain situations. People with Asperger's or autism can learn from comic stories. Uh, you have just this, this, this inability to get over the seduction of the innocent and the idea that juvenile delinquency and comics are the best of friends and that if you give your kid a comic book, you might as well give him a switchblade to hold on the other hand because he's going to become a criminal or she. I mean, some of my personal favorite comic books are really heavy stuff. Like Watchmen. Well, Alan Moore is such a dense writer. Neil yep. Gaiman has brought so much intellect into the comic medium. Frank Miller is more of like your Mickey Spillane, yeah. two gunner, but <laughs> he's still, you know, he's still got some some very uh, tight uh, storytelling. Yeah, there. especially satire on where our we could be heading with the the Dark Knight Returns. And it is interesting to read that twenty years, twenty plus years later in the future, and see just how. Some things were on point and some things were a little, you know. Yeah, no, it's kind of, and mm -hmm. I like going back and rereading some of the older ones and seeing just uh -huh. how spot on they were. But that was kind of the same thing with just all science fiction in general. Mm -hmm. In my opinion is that it's weird when you look at science fiction, how forward thinking, and even with their mm -hmm. uh, warning stories, the stories of this shouldn't happen, how often some of those things actually have come to be. Well, some of the best science fiction is, is, you know, these are all amateur or professional futurists going out there and trying to write something based on their life experience and things that they've studied. So there is definitely that, wow, I can't believe they were so forward thinking. <laughs> but then again, if one wants to make the argument, the capabilities of man are finite. So there's got to be at least a few people are going to guess within the realm of probability. Yeah, and it's weird that uh, it's almost that these genres where you see these uh -huh. futurists, and well, not necessarily futurists, but like comic books or, or sci-fi, yeah. don't get as much recognition as being as good as they are. Especially, oh, sorry. I well, no, 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 that, I, I, I agree. I think that, however, there might be an aspect of that sort of thought that is with, 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 with this genre because it's received derision in the past. And even though there's a lot of people that are talking it, maybe there's a lot of focus on the negative. Um, th I mean, you go to Harvard, you're going to be learning about Jules Verne and H.G. Wells. And they are, I mean, H.G. Wells advised governments. I mean, this is like something that, 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 that like Knight Alts, Arthur C. Clarke, he was working on satellites. Yeah. A brilliant man. Heinlein, he wrote a book for every letter in the, every number in the Dewey Decimal System. <laughs> and, and, you know, the derision, I think, might be, um, the derision might be, be there, but I don't think it's as, I don't, I think it's overstated. It's, like it's over, okay. I think there's more appreciation than is actually let on, but, you know. <laughs> well, you, if you're, if you're, 
looking at comic books or uh -huh. looking at sci-fi. You can't tell uh -huh. people you like that stuff. Fantasy, no, no. That's well, I, <laughs> I don't know if I went to Oticon or comic <laughs> or the Comic Con. I'm I'm sure I'd want to use those as selling points. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> I was like, oh, I was reading uh, Cavalier and Clay the other day. <laughs> Pulling out the extremely obscure references. Yeah. So what possessed him, other than just the fact that he, or that Jeppy enjoyed comics, what really possessed him, like, that really pushed him in 2006 to say, we need to do this, I'm going to put this together? Everything came together. Okay. Uh, he he found out about this property being available in Camden Yards, Camden Station, where we're located. Uh, he loves uh, the, the Orioles. He's a part owner. He loves coming to the ballpark. It was one of his favorite places. He was like, this is a beautiful place. This is where my museum could be. He had the resources to put it together. He had the collection. And so it all just, it was just the time. That's how it happened. And is this, is this collection his or the museum's or that one and the same? This one is pretty much, the collection is 90% Steve's. We okay. have a few loans here and there, but the majority of it is all his. Wow, that's quite mm -hmm. impressive. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a true labor of love. And these, how far back do, does your collection of, and we're in the comic book room right now, so I'll ask you about that. Okay. How far back does your collection of comics go? Well, the collection of comics, as we understand comics today, one example we have is an early, of an early comic book is the veritable history of M. Bachelor, Mr. Bachelor Butterfly, which was done by Toffer, who created Obadiah Obak, who is seen by some people as the father of the graphic novel and comic book. And he was Swiss. Okay. And his books were translated and popular in the States. So what year is that from? Or about, about the 1840s, 1840s, circa 1840s. Wow, so your collection goes back over Wow, over a century and a half. Yes, yes, we have, well, we go even further than that sometimes. We've had objects that are pre-16th century, but uh, they've been rotated out. We've, we have some newspaper examples that are from the early 18th century. Okay. That I could show you. So uh, we do have, but those are not comic books. Those are just artifacts that you have. Or Correct. Exhibits, okay. and. Being a comic book fan, I can get the comic books, but there are other, this museum has not just comics, this is pop culture. No, we are a uh, entertainment memorabilia museum. You come into Jeppy's Entertainment Museum, we have things related to movies, to dolls, to, to cinema, to uh, products that have become popular. Basically, we're about iconic characters. Okay. A character is created, say in one medium, like Crazy Cat is created by George Harriman for newspaper strips, and then he goes over and becomes a toy. He becomes a cartoon series. We try to represent stuff like that. Felix the Cat, he becomes the world's most popular silent, silent film cartoon star, but then he also becomes a newspaper strip, and it becomes games, toys, dolls. He gets his likeness on everything. Okay. And um, why, what is important about remembering and being able to see the history of comics and pop culture? What can people glean from that? Well, there's a whole bunch of things they can glean. There's a change in narrative style. There's a change in uh, artistry, the way things are illustrated, the things that are focused on. For example, you're not going to see a lot of comics in the 70s and 80s that are too World War II heavy. You might see those paced out before that when you know, there's more of a fascination in that, that era of American history. You'll see pre-war comics that focus on exciting things of the time, like aviation's a big deal. You've got your flying superheroes that really come into the forefront in the 1930s with the advent of Superman and his uh, stone's throw away brother, Captain Marvel. Um, you see like the way that they're illustrated. What is a human? in terms of what is an appealing human. Because Superman starts out as like a beefy, stocky guy, and now he's more of a trimmed down, svelte thing, representing what the attractiveness is. At the time, and the same with the female characters that you'll see. What is Wonder Woman's uh, body change like over the years? What will, what to appeal to people? Like, will Francis the Talking Mule still appear in a comic in the 80s and 90s? Things seem to be a little grittier, a little more edgy. Or, or a little more tied into like the novelties of the time, whether it be the television shows or uh, perennials like Barbie. They 
it's interesting to see what sticks and what doesn't and how things change in an illustrative style over time, in design well, style. It seems like comic books and pop culture are almost a barometer for the people of the time, a reflection of what they're into, their concerns, their hopes, their fears. Well, that's, that's basically true with most of the entertainment medium, that comics and media, they show what we are at a given time, and then they become indicators of where we've been. Because this is like a where, while with the museum's collection is growing, there's still a lot of, I've been there. And this has been, been there in a way that some museums don't have, which is, I've been there, and I've been there with that. I've had that. That's my comic. I know that. I read that under my bed sheets when I was 10. I snuck that into uh, a library. I was uh, supposed to be doing a term paper, but I read that drug issue on Spider-Man. It's like these are the things that we've grown up with. And we come back, and we're like, oh, wow. And it opens up these wellsprings. It's like a touchstone to like a wider memory experience. You go in and then you can recall all that, sometimes. Well, no, I gotta say, actually, okay. uh, when I was here previously, uh -huh. I felt bad because I was only half paying attention because I was doing exactly that. I was yeah. like, oh, I remember reading that. I remember when I got that comic. Oh my uh -huh. God, I haven't seen that comic in years. And uh -huh. there was that nostalgia that, that came back and seeing objects, at least as you were saying, for me, that I owned. I okay. had, I still might even have at my parents' house. Whereas if you go to like the Smithsonian and you're seeing some of the objects, it's okay. history, but it's, there's yeah. not that um, direct connection that, okay. that you were talking about. And I didn't think about it until you said it now, but it's, it really is kind of amazing how that mm -hmm. pulls me, or, well, pulled me in. It, it's one of the things about working here that can get kind of like distracting as you're walking through trying to do your work and they're like, oh yeah, 1984, I bought that comic. And it's, it, it hits you even after you've become overly familiar with the material. Wow. So you, I would say then for you, this is like amazing to, to just be like here and then, you know, mm -hmm. see the comics and do you ever get to read any of them? I have not read any of the comics that are on display, but I do get the opportunity to sometimes read copies that are not display worthy. Okay. So, wow. That's really cool. It is. <laughs> it is. They have that unique comic smell. As people say, <laughs> comics of a certain age have a distinct aroma that sort of becomes sort of, you'll see people open comics from CGC and sniff the pages. They really? love this old comic smell. No. I, I've noticed that, not necessarily with comics, but I, um, I'll go back and I'll get an old paper book from just like my collection mm -hmm. from 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and it just has that smell, a different smell than books do mm -hmm. now. It's, I don't know what it is. When people come here, is there something yeah. you really want them to be able to pull out of their experience when they come here, see the comics, see the displays? Well, one of the main things we want people to come in and is, is to be like, feel the, uh, the intensity of memory, the, to, to see all these wonderful things from the past, and not just have a direct experience with it, but engage with it on what it is, see what it's like, enjoy it for what it brought to a certain era. But another thing that we want people to do is just marvel at the differences in time and the similarities. There's so many different aspects a person can bring to this. If one's a graphic designer, they'll come in and be like, well, I'm seeing how everything's laid out. If somebody's a fan of comics, they'll be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this character was around that early, or I didn't know they started that late. There's, uh, uh, with the toys and the materials, it's like, wow, Mickey or, or Goofy, they look so different over the years. They're, they're changing, they're constantly evolving, and also see things that were very popular, but their time has passed. Like the brownies. Oh, Palmer Cox's brownies. It's amazing. They were so popular in the 1880s, and yet I just heard about them for the first time today. And I'm Scottish. So <laughs> they might, those might be the kind of things we want. We want people to basically connect. And we feel that we do that because you're connecting with things that you've experienced, and you're seeing them in a way that is, again, reverential. And yet you can almost touch them. They're close enough that you can reach out, you can really look at them in a finite way. 
it's, I've been to quite a few museums uh -huh. and it seems like, like I, I went to the New York State Museum recently and that was just mm -hmm. the history of New York State and it went back from before there were even humans uh -huh. uh, living there all the way up to, to modern time. But the exhibits were so different that there was a, almost uh -huh. a disconnect. There was not, you weren't able to compare and contrast. And that's kind of the amazing thing about this place is that you uh -huh. can see hundreds of years of exhibits about yeah. the same thing, about the same topics. And you can see that that um, evolution, and you mm -hmm. guys, well, at least my opinion, you guys document it well. Well, thank you. We we try to keep everything within the parameters of a certain era. We want things to we want things to branch out, but we also want to keep it within reason, so you have a scope in which to set your mind on it. And we try to choose like strong periods of time: 1928 to 1945, depression end of World War II, 46 to 60, the beginning of the baby boomer rise, the, the interest in television, the sort of, what they say, the innocence of America, 61 to 70, when things become like very different, the youth rise, the, the youth movement, things are changing, the whole perceptions on the way people view America and view the way life should be held are shifting in a dramatic fashion. I mean, these things happen constantly, but this is like, boom, wow. It's a very colorful, very aromatic era. Then you go to 71 to 80, how things suddenly become more about the blockbuster, how merchandise comes from new areas, food, fast food organizations are creating icons that people are buying as toys to play with. They're taking Chicken McNuggets home as their friends. They're taking a Ronald McDonald whole doll home to snuggle up with at night. They have a Burger King toy to play with. They have uh, dolls related to their favorite mascots that are selling them food. And then you have all the continuation of movie tie-ins, how Star Wars has basically taken the idea of licensed material for a film and done with it that only really, like, to the degree that Disney had done before, where they take this template, like, we have an item, how do we sell it to the widest group? And they throw it on everything, and amazingly, it sells like hotcakes and makes George Lucas a very wealthy man. Yeah, I can't remember the uh, statistics, but I, I recall at one point uh -huh. hearing that they, some insanely large amount of money they made just through merchandising. I heard it was like a billion dollar a year industry in the 70s. Wow. And that's the 70s. That's, yeah, before it really, like, yeah. conceivably, um, you could kind of collect at least the whole uh, collection of toys yeah. in the 70s, but like now you have to almost be a millionaire to have the collection of toys because there's so many. And, and that's just toys. Toys that you have to not only be a millionaire, but you have to have the gift of infinite time to even play with properly. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it's... But it's, but it's great because they have the figures now. They're so detailed. The hands will pop off and are held on by magnets. They're, it's, it's, it's amazing how that Star Wars stuff has really progressed. And uh, do, do, you have, do you have some of the toys here? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, like, people could come here and they could, you know, if they're, you're like, well, any age you can come uh -huh. here, but say you're like a 12 or 13 year old and you have your Star Wars toys that are contemporary uh -huh. and you walk in here and then they can see where they came from. And that's kind of an interesting contrast that you can't, you don't always get that you have these modern toys that, modern okay. toys, comics, television shows that, we're so inundated with it's you know if you're a fan uh -huh. you're a fan but then you get to come in and see something that you know see it how it was in the past okay um like and and we're right next to one of um my favorite uh comic book characters that's not as popular now as he used to be is captain marvel and that actually yes surprised me when I was here before how popular he was in the past. He was far more successful than Superman. DC Comics had an ongoing lawsuit with Fawcett Publications to get him off the stands. And apparently, 
the clue was, the secret Fawcett had is there was no copyright on this Superman newspaper strip. So they were able to use that as a reference on why they shouldn't get sued. Um, the character, however, you know, even though there was a great 70s television show, never really maintained his consistency like Superman did. And when comic sales started going down in the 50s, uh, Fawcett just dropped it. And he was like, yeah, we don't want to deal with this anymore. Wow. And um, basically, DC eventually took over the character. Uh, couldn't use the name for a little while because Marvel had Captain Marvel. Yep. Had to go by Shazam. Well, the comics had to go by Shazam. And then eventually he got his name back, and he's moderately popular in the DC universe right now. Yeah. He, not to go off on a tangent that's just a total geek thing, but uh -huh. I, I always found that, that he seems to be written about almost now as like a tragic character. If he's in like Kingdom Come, uh -huh. he's that, that, that guy that everybody like used to like, and he's kind of fallen to the wayside, and he's just trying to get his, you know, himself back. And I think that might almost be a representation of where he is now. Well, a lot of people coming to this have a, are very well versed on the, the history of comics, and it's fun to play with those kind of narratives that are based on actual history, folding that in. I mean, the thing I like about him is he's uh, originally designed to look like Fred McMurray, the dad on My Three Sons, who used to be quite the uh, Hollywood movie star in the 40s when he was created. Uh, people might know him from Double Indemnity. Okay, which is which is interesting because if he was popular, that's a a, a, a real person who was yes. popular enough to inspire a comic, but mm -hmm. nowadays is not a well known person. He's not like Humphrey Bogart no. or John Wayne, where everybody knows his name. But mm -hmm. in his heyday, he was inspiring comics. Yes, he, it's. A, there's been a lot of talk about who's inspired what characters over the year. There's a little bit of Clark Kent, supposedly, and Clark Kent, Clark Gable. So, and, and that's a name some people will still remember. So they would actually write in, or at least now they're writing in histories, they're fictionalizing a history uh -huh. in some comics, you were saying. Like, like you were saying that there was, they, they were folding in history into, yeah. these narr into these fictional stories. Is that yeah. something they do a lot with comics? It's, it's hard to say. I, I mean, Gaiman folds in a lot of history into the Sandman comics, I know that. Alan Moore is a uh, big fan of pulp novels from the turn of the century, gives us League of Gentlemen, but it all depends on the writer. So it's, it's I mean, of course, Marvel and DC have their histories, which keep getting revamped <laughs> now every X amount of years. So there, there's got to be that aspect, but I don't know how much it would apply based on the title. Okay. And it was interesting. Uh, that's one thing that drew me to Moore, and we were speaking okay. of, the, uh, of um, the extraordinary big of gentlemen, mm -hmm. is how much, how many literary references, and with that, you actually have to know classic literature yes. to get <laughs> even like half of the references. There is so much going on there that's mm -hmm. not just for, you know, any Joe Schmo is not gonna get it. You need to have actually studied yeah. classic literature. Or in a way, it's a great introduction. You're like, I loved this book, but I don't know who's Mina. And then it takes a while and a little research to discover, think, oh, Mina Harker from, from Dracula. Yeah. And uh, well, that's the nice thing is it's uh -huh. it's there, but it's not in your face. Like you no. don't have you have to do that seeking out if you don't know. And but the but at the same time, it's got that great writing style where they even though it's riddled with pop culture references, they're pop culture references that your great great grandfather would get. But you don't need them to appreciate the story. Yeah, because those I I mean mm -hmm. I have I think volume one and two, uh, mm -hmm. the collected volumes, and it's. Interesting, it's engaging, mm -hmm. and it's engaging on so many levels. There okay. is that, if you get the references, there's that level, but you don't, as you said, you don't need to get the references. And, but it's something that, well, it's, it's that comic itself is geared more towards yeah. older people because yeah. I believe that comic has nudity in it. It's for mature audiences. It's for mature yeah. audiences. But it still is that example of what of how it's not just a, a funny book. Yeah. It's, it's on par with some great literature. 
Well, the Time Magazine referred to Watchmen as one of the 100 greatest novels of the, of the 20th century. So that glass ceiling of appreciation is being broken. So now we've got that, and we've got Moore, who, have, who has become one of the most outspoken but yet respected comic art writers, um, is now just become like a, almost a household name. Yep. People will seek him out outside of the genre. And, and which is great because it also with the films coming out, a lot of new fans are folding in. Yeah, and I think, um, I can't remember who wrote it, but um, they started teaching in, I don't know if it was middle schools or high schools, uh, uh -huh. Mouse. Oh, uh, that was uh, uh, Art, Art Spiegelman. Art Spiegelman, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, they, and that's a comic that is now considered a good enough, or, or, or not only well written, but a mm -hmm. nice representation. Well, maybe nice is not the word because it's about World War II, but yeah. it's um, the references that are there and the way it's written uh -huh. is good enough that it should be taught, at least in yeah. some schools. They, they, they teach it, and it's almost a way of being able to expose atrocities of this time period. Mm -hmm through a different means if I'm, you know, than just seeing yeah. a, a, a... It's it's a great narrative because it takes it and removes it from, it gives you the removal that's necessary. The father experiences, but it's told by the son. So even as the reader, you can come in and have that one step away experience. He's your voice, the son. So it's like, oh, they, I wasn't there, but now it's become immediate because I'm identifying with an outsider who's being told the horrific incident. It's a, it's a great book. I mean, there's that companion piece, Persepolis. Yes. Uh, that, that one is more of like a first person narrative, but it's also immediate because it gives us this whole new view of an entirely different way of life to, 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 to what you would say, the North American perspective. And that seems like something that, and you can do that with, with novels um, too, but mm -hmm. with comics, as, as we were saying, they, they are a reflection of the era they were written, yeah. but they are also a way of uh, keeping alive the memory of the more distant past. Yes. And in a way that is bringing multiple mediums together, mm -hmm. writing, art, and in my opinion, when it's done right, it's just perfection. Mm -hmm. Well, there's... <laughs> There's a lot of people who agree with you. Entire nations agree with you. There's, in Europe, I believe, uh, in not, not the Netherlands, but uh, Finland, I think their best-selling magazine is Donald Duck Comics. Really? I believe so. Then we have Japan, where manga is not just to, uh, is not just for everybody, is not just, you know, a, a side project. This is like literature. And uh, you've got people in other countries who, who speak of narrative artists like uh, Herridge, who created Tintin, and Peo, who created the Smurfs. This stuff is not just, just you know, this isn't disposable entertainment. These are repurposed stories. You can go and buy a Tintin story today that was done in the 30s, because people in the overseas tend to have a, an interest in this. Asterisk is another name that comes to mind. Just the way things are in other countries, how this is a far more appreciated art in sort of the sense that we think of appreciation. But then here we have academics that are teaching about it. There's courses on it at UMBC, U of Baltimore, uh, University of Baltimore just up the street on comics and, 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 and graphic novels, which are, according to Mer Satrapa, for creator of uh, Persepolis, are the exact same thing. <laughs> but it, it is, it is, it is uh, a fascinating thing. Why do you think that um, outside of just the fans or uh -huh. the academics, and, and I, I have to tend to believe that some of the uh, sorry, I have to tend to believe that some of the academics that are teaching these courses are probably big fans themselves. Uh, hopefully so. <laughs> but why do you think that it's it's more widely accepted in other countries than it is in America? I think. A lot of it stems from Wertheim's seduction of the innocent, that that really tainted the waters on comic appreciation. I think people 
when comics came out initially, they were more of like a television. They were like a bunch of sensational stories about adventures that wouldn't apply to the academics of the time. Um, then television came in, and I think comics just managed to get marginalized. And uh, also, the fact that uh, the fact that it becomes so valuable because of people wanting to come back, and to the point that their older comics are almost like currency, kind of shows that this way of thinking will not is, is in need of revision. But I think. I think there's just some obstinacy in our culture to like accepting things for the way that they really are. That's my feeling. Okay. That there's just a little bit of resistance because again, there people think of comic books in think of them sometimes with blinders. When they think comic book, they think superhero comics. And those are great. Yeah. But there's other ways. There's other stories out there too. There's a whole spectrum. There's romance, there's there's uh, true life, there's biography. Um, and for whatever reason, there just seems to be, and it could just be that it's an easy bullet point to say. Could be just because it's easy to say, comics, it's, that's all they need. Just something to throw out there to deride it because it's easier to deride than to investigate. Interesting. And it's, it's almost, um, I've noticed with television, uh -huh. yeah. it's, it's the same, same thing of it's taken so long for outside of news television, for television to be really recognized as an art form. Mm -hmm. And I mean, now you get, uh, speaking of academics, they're teaching yeah. Joss Whedon. Like there's courses on Buffy the Vampire Slayer yeah. and, and the overall implications and all the things that, that go with that. Um, but when you look at, say like England, they yeah. have seemed to really take their art forms more seriously? Well, they're also a smaller group of people. So, you know, it's more of like a state loving a material. So there's, there's not as much uh, difference of opinion, but they, 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 they're a very appreciative group and they do take their stuff seriously. Although they used to wipe all their Doctor Who episodes. So yeah. how seriously did they take a <laughs> Doctor Who we're talking here, classic series. I heard about that. Uh, yeah. What was it? They're, um, they have a reward of a Dalek if somebody has a copy of the first regeneration. An actual Dalek or a doll that looks like a Dalek? Oh, no, like an actual prop. Oh, okay. Like, like a full size uh, prop <laughs> of, of, okay. of a Dalek if somebody has a copy of the first regeneration, the episode where one regenerated to two. I think all they have is like the test footage of yep. that. And then there's the one where uh, Troughton becomes Pertwee, where there's no regeneration footage. He just falls out of the police box the next time you see him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but. he's just, well, that's kind of uh, uh, similar to the, the film, the eighth mm -hmm. one. The eighth one? Oh, or, uh, the one with, um, no, he. Oh, wait, no, Sylvester McCoy, you didn't, you yeah. saw his, but you didn't see you, eight to nine. You didn't see the regeneration of the war doctor into uh, Christopher Eccleston. Right. So, and uh, or before that, but you yeah. <laughs> saw him turn all bright at the end of at the end. It, but. Yeah, is this museum? Yeah, and this is going to be a couple part question. But is there more museums like this in the country? Well, there's museums that feature similar material. Uh, there's Museum in Pittsburgh. There is um, the uh, Museum of Cartoon Art in uh, San Francisco. And then there's uh, MOCA up in New York City that's currently uh, in transition, the Museum of Comic and Cartoon Art. Okay, but there's not a, a large abundance, it doesn't sound like, that, that focus on entertainment and comic books. Co entertainment and comic books, from my experience, there's like a handful. It's not as widespread as we'd like. There used to be, of course, the, the museum that was uh, Mort Walker's museum. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't last. But that was a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, then there's also the Strong Museum, but that's toys. That's up in Rochester. Okay. Um, but again, you're right. There's, there's really, the, but I think this is, a, this, is, this is the start of a change. Like we're on the, a part of a, of a new movement where this art, which has influenced generations of people is now getting museum status. 
So, so you're really almost in a unique opportunity to be able to show mm -hmm. this history like very few other museums can. Yes. Now, you're the associate curator here. What drew you to want to work here? Well, for myself personally, this is in an area that I'm interested in. I'm an American studies major. I love Americana. I've always been interested in American cinema, in American comics, in American uh, toys and games. And this was just a museum that was dedicated about the stuff that I should say my retention level is at its apex. So I came here because the, associate, the, the curator at the time and me were friends. We were actually worked together on a book called Zombie Mania, 80 Movies to Die For. It's a guide to zombie films. He was offered the position and they brought me in as a registrar. I had previous experience working with companies in New York doing, um, doing basically archival work. They brought me in. And then as things progressed, I moved up to the point where I was the associate curator. And again, this is a labor of love, pretty much. So I was able to, using my information and his information, we were able to cobble together where everything fit along with, you know, we had guides, other people guides, but, okay. we, but people outside of the museum that would come in and reference stuff, but basically be able to create this timeline uh, uh, based on the specs of our overseer, Steve Jeppe. Excellent. And, um now, why a book on zombies? Oh, if I was a huge fan of zombies. I uh, was very much a George A. Romero, Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, Lucio Fulci fan. I, I very much appreciated the genre. I, I, I'm, I kind of think of zombies as the horror westerns, where it's basically a bare-bone plot. You have a very simple thing, but the, the complexity is in the moral actions one takes to get from A to B what is the hero going to do in order to survive or sacrifice himself in the end? And I think zombie movies, particularly uh, Romero's, are good in that fashion. And, and the other ones, like maybe a Fulci zombie movie, is more of like response to natural disasters. Okay. Like basically your update of Hurricane, John Ford's Hurricane, Deluge, uh, the, uh, the and of course, you know, like maybe a zombie day after tomorrow, where basically people are dealing with a natural disaster that actually has consequences. Zombie movies tend to be a little darker. There's a variety of reasons. Mostly, I l really have an interest in mob mentality, and okay. zombies are the ultimate representation of that. Yeah, it's kind of, um, I personally studied uh -huh. horror films when I went to school. Um, yeah. But I know that this is almost like a thing with, with comics and people see yeah. them as just like, oh, this, you know, uh -huh. schlock stuff, you know, people just uh -huh. getting killed. But you see with like Romero's Dawn uh -huh. of the Dead yeah. that that was a representation of the mentality of the time. Where consumer culture. Consumer culture. Yeah. And it was done in a way that oh, haha, ha, this is a horror film. Uh -huh. People are getting hacked and slashed and all these things. But there was an underlying commentary mm -hmm. on American culture of the time. Yes, very much so. And sadly, I think it's extremely relevant now, too, which uh -huh. is why they were able to do the remake, and it still had, while I don't think the remake was as good as the, the first one, it mm -hmm. still was able to have similar themes and be yeah. understood nowadays. It was, it was successful on its own. Yes. And people that were even unaware of the previous movies enjoyed it and even though it kept a lot of the key points and was its own entity it still resonated and also helped to inspire what we're basically going through now which is our zombie renaissance and it is definitely a renaissance there's a zombie yeah. film everywhere <laughs> there's zombie films on Redbox every week yes netflix is popping a new one up all the time and and then television show after television yeah. show and Walking Dead is bringing in huge numbers. It's a, one of the most popular shows on television right now. And people are, are really responding to this. We just had Brad Pitt in World War Z. Yep. $200 million movie about zombies. <laughs> and uh -huh. in my opinion, it seems like that's something that might not have happened 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that they would pay that much money for a zombie flick. No. Where's that $20 million movie about vampires? I don't see it. No. <laughs> I see zombies, and I hear sequel, so. Oh, they are doing a sequel to that? I'm, 
I've heard that they might. It did very well. Okay. I actually haven't seen it yet. I, yeah, I have. Brad Pitt saves the world isn't and doesn't bust his hair up. Isn't any good? He literally saves everybody. <laughs> like in the sense that it's like every decision is from him. It's like the antithesis of groupthink. It's like, hey, uh, you guys are all scientists, but I noticed that the zombies are averse to people oh, yeah. who are sick. It's okay. like, oh, thank goodness you were here. We never would have looked for that. Oh, man. Uh, okay. But Sorry, his hair is perfect throughout the whole thing. <laughs> well, as long as he doesn't bust his hair up, that's... That. Well, and also he gets... Every time there's an accident, you know he's going to be okay. <laughs> so it, you don't have to worry about Brad okay. Pitt in that film. It's <sighs> funny in that way. It's... As long as you appreciate the hair, it's one of the best zombie <laughs> movies ever. Definitely top ten for best hair of a zombie best, film. It's amazing. He is like in a sewer system and he walks out and it's coiffed. It's like it's got product in it. It's like we know what his priorities are. Wake up, hair, zombies. Save family. So there should be a whole other cut of the film of, of like between yeah. him killing the zombie and going, hold on a second. Always looks great. Okay. It's like he's the producer Go. or something. <laughs> Is, what's the future for Japanese Entertainment Museum? Well, right now we're just kind of uh, holding fort, see what happens in the next few years. Um, 2000, 2016, we're going to have our 10-year anniversary. And uh, basically, as everything looks right now, there will be a Japanese Entertainment Museum 10 years after that, and hopefully 20 years after that, 30 years after that. I mean, Steve Jeppe, uh, this is his uh, labor of love, and he wants to keep this going, and public response is just growing and growing. Our recent exhibit milestones have been a huge smash. So at this point, I think Jeppe's will be around for the long haul. And are you uh, always acquiring, not necessarily old exhibits, but are you trying to stay current with current uh, comics and media and entertainment so that 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now, it's not current. Well, it wouldn't be current then, but you know, people could look back. Eventually we should be reconfiguring a few rooms to include more materials from certain areas. But at this point, what we do is we have in our gift shop, the 90s onward, where we keep folding in new stuff and eventually we're hoping to maintain a quality of both the past and the present. We're also working with contemporary artists to get them to uh, bring their work in so you can see new artwork among like the old classics. Okay. The art on the wall. Yeah. Where does all the art come from or at least most of the art? <laughs> well many of these are from Steve's personal collection. For example the Overstreet comic cards, comics and cards issue over there that blow up poster was a display poster that they had in the office. We brought it down framed it with the original cover. Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos cover, that comes from Jim Steranko's Foom, which was a Marvel fanzine okay. he was doing in the 70s. The Batman poster was a serial giveaway. The original Donald Duck is from Patrick Block. It was a gift to Steve. Then we have an original- Was it a gift from the artist? It was a gift from Patrick Block to wow. Steve. Um, that there are some photo stats from the original official comic Overstreet comic guide, uh, the Superman edition. Those came from the Overstreet archives when Steve purchased the company. He then uh, acquired some of the art mock-ups and some of the original art. Okay, now you said when Steve purchased the company, uh, he doesn't just own part interest in the Orioles and uh, Entertainment Museum. He, no. He has more of a, of a stake in comics too? Uh, Steve is, uh, is an entrepreneur who owns, uh, st who owns uh, Baltimore Magazine. His companies own uh, Hakes Americana and Collectibles. They own the Overstreet Comic Book Price Guide, which is run by uh, Gemstone Publishing. He owns the uh, museum. He owns Alliance Games. He also owns Diamond Select Toys. And that's just a small smattering, and Baltimore Magazine, if I haven't mentioned that already. And that's all kind of in that line mm -hmm. of media, entertainment, yes, uh, culture. Absolutely, and he's like a huge fan of the city, so that's why it's here. He was born down the street in Little Italy. Okay. And he, again, he owns the city magazine. Now, um, 
does has he ever said what drew him to comics in the first place? Why pop culture? Why history? Or why media? There's one story that that's been mentioned a few times. It's a combination of factors. One of his nephews was reading a comic book one day, and he remembered loving comics as a kid. It reminded him of his love of it. He then thought, hey, people are really getting into this. And then he started a store, and then he just happened to be a guy that was able to do the, the right thing one step after another. He opened a store. He was then managing other people's businesses. He then realized, why am I managing other people's businesses? Why don't I do bigger? And then he was able to create a distribution system, which then became Diamond Select Diamond, Distrib Diamond Comics Distributors, which then gave him the resources to invest in other uh, similar industries, being you know auctions, publication houses, and so on. With the resurgence of so many comic book films uh -huh. in like the last, I could say decade, but a little bit less than that, uh -huh. have you seen an increase of interest in comics, especially Absolutely. the history? Well, I, we've seen an increase, and there's also uh, the demonstrable part is you see, first of all, Diamond's doing wonderful. Second of all, you have two major companies revamping their lines to bring in fresh readership. They're starting from scratch. Marvel's starting from scratch. DC just did the, the 52. Right. So everybody is going back and getting things rebooted because this interest is coming in and they want to be fresh for that. They want people to start at a point where they could say, hey, I was there at the beginning. Similar to what DC did in 86 uh, with their new line and Marvel tried with their new universe line at around the same time. So, but right now, there's so much activity in comics uh, because of these films, in part, that it's helping to revitalize the medium. Not revitalize, but it's helping to give it a, a little bit of a boost. It's okay. increasing everything. And it seems like it's a, it's a wider boost than just fans. Because you look at like Comic-Con, yeah. and at the time, you know, Comic-Con used to just be comics, but now it's where film companies go, or film or television yeah. companies go to show their new work, and people who are not just comic book fans mm -hmm. are being exposed to, you know, coming to these for the films, for the stars, but then being exposed to all the comics as well. Okay. Well, yes, and also it's uh, enabled people to, very popular now, cosplay which has helped to bring attention to the comics. Again, people see these characters, they respond to these characters, and then they see themselves in these characters and dress up in them and go out, and it's a, a very, very popular uh, uh, thing for people to do nowadays. Do you think that's a reflection on how comics are a reflection of the culture? That somebody can go and say, I see this, this comic book character, I see a part of myself in that character. Uh -huh. I want to dress up as that character. Is there a correlation between being able to see yourself in these characters enough that you want to dress up as them uh -huh. and the reflection that the comics are really that well, that good of a representation of the mindset nowadays? Well, I think that it's, I think it's a good representation of that mindset. And also, this is a, a group of people that are, you know, uh, cosplayers. They, they see an interesting design and they want to mimic it. But it's not always about the character being them. A lot of times it is, because there's a lot of time invested in this. But it's about, this is something that I could present myself as. And for many people, putting on a costume changes their whole perspective on themselves and gives them greater freedom to appreciate, uh, gives them greater freedom while in a crowd. I shouldn't say appreciate, but just greater freedom emotionally, personally, and it can also give them a lot of positive feedback because if you walk down the street wearing a nice suit, you might hear, oh, that looks nice every once in a while, but if you're dressed up as a really cool Batman, you're going to hear that, wow, awesome Batman, Batman, <laughs> a lot of affirmation. And the reverse might be true. It it's almost seems to me like it's this, um, well, when you're, when you're younger, when uh -huh. you're like, seven or eight or you know it can be a little bit older there was that idea of you know you put on the mask even if it was like a paper mask yeah. of your superhero and you're that superhero and it gives you hopes and dreams yeah and now people are almost doing that or people are doing that only they're older and yeah. they're still being able to put on these masks though it's not necessarily yeah. paper it's 
foam board and, and in some cases yeah. the real you know leather and stuff like that mm -hmm. but they're able to f almost feel like they're a child again with that uh, feeling mm -hmm. the aspirations and the hopes and dreams a lot of times people look at these things as being childish behaviors but as they get older and our community and our our way of thinking is 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 more allowable you know we don't have to dress up a certain way we're allowed to be more be, free to be me uh, people are seeing this, and they're going with, uh, they're going with like, you know, I, this isn't something that's just reserved for youngins and Halloween. This is something that I enjoy. Let's make it a part of my life. Then, and they go with it. And some people even turn it into cottage industries. They become the character. I mean, we've had cosplayers in here that can do backflips that Spider-Man would be envious wow. of. We have guys that mimic Daredevil to the point that you're like, I don't know which is better, the comic or you. <laughs> It's, and women that have been in here that go and, uh, we, we actually have several cosplayers that work at the museum that go out and spend all their time, like not all their time, but a majority of their time, dressing up and, and mimicking to almost exact, exact replications of the characters that they love. And, and they're not young people in the sense that, you know, they're not in high school, they've grown, graduated, they, they have normal lives, and they're indulging in just something that, 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 that they find personal delight in doing and they don't see today. There's not a lot of derision towards people that do this. Well, it, there's television shows that are yes. holding them up. Well, the cosplayer community is a little up and as my understanding is, cosplayers are a little on the fence with the shows that are about them because of the reality program and the, and the manipulation of information there. But for the most part, those kind of indicators tell us that this is not an aberration. This is part of the American life. And even though there might be a little bit of a, a snarkiness to it, the, the reality is, is that the people themselves that are participating, they don't have that ironical ditch, disattachment. They're not looking at this like, oh, it's so ironic, I'm dressed as, <laughs> you know, even though Peter Parker's glib, Peter Parker's not ironic. He's, right. he's not, you know, meta commenting on his own existence depending on the writer, but normally. <laughs> but that's interesting okay. that you say that, that that's an indication of how comics are being viewed as more adult and, and then uh -huh. being okay, because that goes back to the idea of that all this media, depending on the time period, is an indication of the time period. Yes. That, that comics were an indication of the thoughts mm -hmm. and hopes and dreams and fears, as I said before. Okay. So it's almost this weird circle that finally yeah. culture is bringing in the it bringing comics into the fold as comics have always brought other things into the fold yes and i think like with today like uh today's ceos they're the people that grew up on comics so they don't the the generation that put them down even though there's still some animosity the main the main organizations that put them down are actually being taken over by the people that want to bring them up. I mean, Disney, Disney years ago, they had the best-selling comics in the world. Donald Duck still sells well. They've now got Marvel. They've now got the second or top, depending on the mark, the sales that week, uh, comic company in the world. And, and they're Star Wars now too. Star Wars too. So we'll see some interesting hybrids hopefully <laughs> in the future. Yeah. But um, well, they you know. And that's, and that's a company that was actually founded by a man who was going into a, an area that people thought was secondary, Walt Disney, who goes into animation, which was sort of like the lesser part of filmmaking, and turned it into its own art form, turned it into its own business, took his ideas and shared them. I mean, he's been viewed as sort of like a, you know, Disney infotainment kind of guy, but you know, that's sort of a that's sort of easier to say than to tend to prove. Well, and, and in my opinion, no matter how jaded a person can pretend to be, yeah. at one point in their life, they were touched by something Disney did. Yes. I mean, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who didn't cry a Bambi or, yeah. you know. <laughs> who wasn't familiar with a uh, Pixar movie, because now that. that his name has been extended onto that. I mean, there's a lot of people that don't know Disney's product, but know the, out, the, the outcroppings of what Disney was, which has become, you know, he's, his name is still attached to the best animated movies coming out. Frozen, 
made. Yep. There's, we've got a whole new generation of kids that will know Disney because of Frozen. Yep. Tangled. I can't, couldn't believe how popular that took off. It was like, inc boom. incredibly successful. It's now, the, I think, their highest grossing animated film ever. Wow. I unadjusted for box office. Wow. I mean, unadjusted for uh, inflation. Wow. Okay, so right. we're in the milestone exhibit. Uh, could yeah. you talk about this? Sure, absolutely. Milestones was the brainchild of Michael Davis, Tatiana, and the president of the museum, Missy Jeppy Bauer Sucks. They wanted to do a representation of African Americans in comics, pop culture, and beyond. So Michael Davis and Tatiana, using their connections, got us a whole bunch of outstanding contemporary artists, uh, John Jennings, Sean Martinborough, uh, Don McGregor, who worked for Saber. He has some of the artwork related to his Saber comic here. We have um, also uh, Ken Lashley, uh, Alice Leung, um, representations of popular characters like Storm, thanks to uh, Sideshow Collectibles. We have the Blockheads are here. We have um, upstarts, people that are working on uh, new materials. We also have like up-and-comers like Michelin Hess. Uh, one of my favorites is, of course, the fact that we have Kyle Baker's work here. Some very nice artwork. Uh, Gil Ashby is here, and uh, I could just prattle off names, but the idea is generally just to bring together a collection of African American artists and people who produce, like Don McGregor, people who produce uh, notable works in the history of African American comic characters that uh, it could come in and be a celebration. And of course, also, Michael Davis helped found the company, Milestone Media, way back in the 90s where they were one of the first African-American owned companies that had been bought by DC, not bought, but they had their titles distributed through DC. And people consider like some of their characters like Static Shock, Icon to be some of the greatest representations of African-American culture as told by African-Americans and not what they saw as sort of a pardon the uh, cliche here, the whitewashing by, you know, you have a black character, but it's not written by a, by, by a black artist. And, and that's what Milestones wanted to rid itself of. It wanted to rid, I mean, there are exceptions, but it wanted to have this sort of celebration of black African-American comic art, and that's what this is. And if you go around the room, you'll see some lovely stuff by Danny Cowan on the wall. You'll be able to study the line work. Andrew Aden's uh, March has original artwork here and Congressman John Lewis, I should add. Um, and there's up-and-comers, uh, and there are uh, professionals like Keith Knight. And um, people just really have been responding very positive to, to, our, to our exhibit. It's, it's a wonderful exhibit. And now, when does the exhibit end? December 31st, 2014, it has been extended. Excellent. I uh, thought, yeah, because I, I thought it was only uh, April or it something. It was originally like going to end in April uh, 27th, 2014, but we extended it because of overwhelming, um, the, the overwhelming response for a full year. We want to keep it in here. We want people to really come in and enjoy it. We've had a lot of repeat visitors. People are really inquiring about this, and some of it afterwards is going to be folded into our regular collection. Okay. So it's, it's very good for us. Now, when it does end, is uh -huh. it going to be going to, do you know if it's going to like other locations? There are talks about turning it into a traveling exhibit. Nothing has been definitive yet, but there are murmurs that it may move on. At this point, I wouldn't be able to say where it would go if it did, but hopefully it will. Yeah, hopefully it will travel, because I think it's an exhibit worthy of that. And then after that, there is, uh, there's an Eisner exhibit that we're going to be putting on. Okay. But we could talk about that at a different time. This is really about, you know, coming in and appreciating the work of Michael Davis himself, where you see some of his original art around here, the works of Vince White, uh, just enjoying pages from, the, from Michael Jai White's Black Dynamite comics and, and related uh, advertisements for the, for the cartoon. Some really, really solid stuff. It's almost more acceptable for an artist, an overreaching term artist, meaning writer, uh -huh. filmmaker, that they can put out their frustrations in a way that's not just like somebody yelling on the street saying, give me respect. 
Okay. Does that make sense? Like, if you make a criticism in a com okay, like, yeah. in, in, like in fiction, if you, like science fiction, you have a, a thing where you're making a criticism. It's mm -hmm. framed as fiction, mm -hmm. but it's making valid points. And in some cases, mm -hmm. people almost learn more from that than they do from somebody going, listen to me, you know. Well, if you put information in, in, in the field, if you put information wrapped inside, hidden inside the wrap of entertainment, people will retain that. If you just preach to them, they have a tendency to zone out. Yeah, I always found it interesting um, of how it can be used or art can be uh -huh. used as, as, as that, that way of teaching yeah. without having the people zone out. And it, um, this is, you know, I think one of the cases of people being able to read, mm -hmm. read these comics and see the art being produced by the people it's being represented of. Mm -hmm. so. Well, that's exactly what we were. That's exactly what Michael Davis and Tatiana wanted to do, Missy, of course. Uh, and just, you know, it's, we feel it's a celebration, but it's not a, uh, it's, it's not static, so to speak. It's static shock, <laughs> but it's not, uh, it's something you come in and you just immediately hit you and there's a, a wonderful uh, diversity in the materials present from comic panels to, to, to acrylics, to oils, to, uh, from the familiar to the fresh, it's, it's a very well-rounded exhibit. We were talking before about how pop culture can be a reflection of the hopes and fears mm -hmm. of the contemporary for that time. And um, I wanted you to talk a little bit about this because this is during, I guess you could say, the atomic age. Yes. This case is... Uh, Dedicated science fiction materials from 46 to 60. Basically what we're talking about here is a time in American history where science was both the benevolent benefactor and the evil villain all wrapped in once. You had science as the destruction of all, the grower of insects because of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You have this atomic blast that shows what science can do. It can kill us all. But then you also have the science of space travel. Sputnik goes out, circles the globe, people are suddenly clamoring for outer space western travels and also wanting to discuss the, the, uh, the, the less appealing aspects, like what happens if radiation leaks. And a lot of this is translated in gigantism, like giant insects, giant ants, uh, giant people. All those 50s. All those 50s. Like the horror films. The Bird Eye Gordon, Mr. Biggs <laughs> work. But here is a nice representation of some materials that you would have had at the time, mostly focusing more on the, the cowboy aspect. In this case, we have like classic TV shows, Tom Corbett, Space Cadet, Flash Gordon, who had been created by Alex Raymond decades before, gets a resurgence in population, popularity. Uh, Space People, Archer Games ties into the whole the whole um, outer space uh, interest. In fact, Space People is very interesting because Archer released a War of the Worlds playset that had a beautiful illustration on the box of the alien ships from the George Powell movie blowing up a city. And when you open it up, it just was a bunch of these space people in there and a truck. <laughs> um, false advertising. False advertising, yes. I guess you had to put the box as the backdrop. Oh. And then we also, uh, you know, we have a lot of the collectible rings, you know, your giveaway premiums, including right in there is the Lone Ranger atomic ring. It's the one that looks like a bullet with a little red tab at the end. This piece is amazing. It had an actual radioactive isotope in it. And you could see it back then. The half-life was, half-life was not long, so it, it's, it doesn't work anymore. But you could see through, if you pulled the little tab off and looked in it, you could see the flickering of this little uh, radioactive element. So they actually had a ring that was encouraging kids to put radioactive material yes. right up to their eye. And put it on their finger all day long. <laughs> it was apparently one of the greatest successes in all of, uh, in all of the history of um, premiums. And, and the effects will never truly be known. Well, <laughs> 
Hopefully it was a mild enough radioactive element that we don't have a lot of like nine-fingered kids, you know, the Frodo <laughs> syndrome of the 50s. Yeah. Wow. So, I, um, which is, you were saying the thing about, about focusing on the, the cowboy aspect. It really does seem like America has always had a, not only just a fascination uh -huh. with cowboys in the Western sense, but there is that idea of bringing that uh -huh. cowboy, the frontiersman, into space. I mean, and that's still something they're doing nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, television, I don't know why exactly it, there's a resurgence, but in the last decade or so, there's been uh -huh. a resurgence of that idea of Americans as explorers, as frontiersmen, in a more future setting, like Revolution, um, mm -hmm. or the best example, Firefly. Yes. Of, of having that, and it speaks, I, just, I don't know why there's a resurgence now, but it mm -hmm. definitely speaks to that idea of um, American culture and American mindset. It, it the, the, the most I can say is on uh, one theory is the, uh, the, the maturity of an idea from the party that's interested. For example, Josh Whedon, I'm sure he was watching Battlestar Galactica as a kid. He said, how can I make this better? And yet, I don't want it to be, it can't be Battlestar Galactica because now it's my thing and then Firefly comes from that. Same as he probably grew up on the Universal Horror movies and thought, what could I do to make these vampires cooler? Or Hammer, actually, and uh, it comes back when he matures and then also he's coming from a generation. This is, by the way, interesting you should bring that. Why does it come back? This is the Spielberg George Lucas generation. This is what Spielberg and George Lucas were fed from their televisions and their interests in comics and their interests in movies. They were watching this. And what does this give us suddenly? It gives us Close Encounters of the Third Kind. It gives us Star Wars. It gives us so much just from those two men, and they're just like one small group. There's also Joe Dante is watching this, and he comes up with his love letters to this. So I feel that it's a, I feel that one way you could theorize it is cyclical. And then the, the place that there's little places where people grow up on it, have strong love for it, and then they finally reach the age where they can bring it back. And it seems like yeah. with that cyclical nature, uh -huh. that every time it comes around, mm -hmm. the creators are able to put a little bit of themselves into it, a little yeah. bit of of, you know, their, what's affecting them. Mm -hmm. I mean, in case in point, when you watch the, the um, Indiana Jones trilogy and you have the, the first one, which is great, you know, yeah. uh, you know, there's strife in it, but there's that, that triumphant, uh -huh. but then you have the second one where you find out that I think Lucas was going through his divorce and it's a really dark, the uh -huh. people are getting, you know, their hearts ripped out and it's, you know, there's that, that uh -huh. aspect. Um, and then you come back and there's the, the happy Nazi one. Well, not that it's happy Nazis. They, they are very bad Nazis, but uh -huh. it's that triumphant feeling again with, with the uh, Last Crusade. Mm -hmm. But it's their own signature. It's their own hopes, dreams, fears that are, they're putting on yeah. their childhood uh -huh. for a future generation. So it's that happy um, collision where all these disparate elements come together and create like a wonderful piece like that and also reflect whether when they're not wonderful if you have an opinion on the Temple of Doom that's lower mm -hmm. like what were the issues that kept that from being say Raiders of the Lost Ark what are the things that made Indiana Jones and the Lost Crusade for some people to be the greatest in the entire saga all of these like things but they're all of their time which as you keep pointing you keep you've mentioned wonderfully it's it's this timeliness that g gives it both its longevity and in some cases not, but it gives it that distinctness and that's again what our museum is about, that like those like little like uh, time in a bottle, our Jim Croce Museum. If you could have time in the bottle, it would be Jeppy's Entertainment Museum.